All right, guys, and welcome to another video. Today, we are going to be talking about sway back posture, and sometimes you can even call it a posterior pelvic tilt. If you don't know me, by the way, my name is Kyle Wall. I am a physical therapist assistant and certified strength and conditioning specialist. So let's, like I said, dive into it. So we're going to grab our pelvis model again. I think this is just gonna be something I do in all these videos. Anyways, sway back posture. This is that presentation where back and hips, I would say, are both traveling forward. I really wanted to talk about this after I discuss anterior pelvic tilt, specifically because the way I view it, or I look at it as a progression of an anterior pelvic tilt. You know, we've discussed already, again, in, in the anterior pelvic tilt video, the anterior pelvic tilt is when everything sort of just dumps forward, especially in relation to this guy here, that femur. So it just falls forward. With a posterior pelvic tilt, sway back posture, whatever you want to call it, basically been so far forward in this anterior pelvic tilt that what it ends up happening is that your body's like, hey, we don't like being here. We need to sort of right whatever's going on and find a more neutral position. But it can't because it has all these tight muscles, all this compressive stuff on the back. So what ends up happening is your body just goes, well, since we're already forward, what if we just scoop our hips underneath us? And again, that's going to look like again, that low back and the butt are just smashed forward. Now, this can happen in both wide and narrow infrasternal angles. That's probably two videos I owe you guys. But, but you'll typically see this with a lot of narrow infrasternal angle people. So essentially, you know, if we really want to dive into why this sway back posture occurs, your center of gravity has been jacked up for a while to where you've had probably an anterior pelvic tilt. And then for whatever reason, you've been there too long, the body doesn't know how to get out of this positioning. So you start to scoop your hips underneath, like so. You really tighten up all these muscles on the back side, deep uh, hip external rotators, even your glutes. I'd even say your hamstrings at the top, and you're kind of stuck there, okay? You're floating toward the end of the spectrum in terms of compensations. One thing to also take into account with the sway back positioning is not only are you probably clenching your butt and you have all this tension down here, you've also probably got low back tension and then you're going to have upper abdominal tension. So like right at that area of the infrasternal angle, rectus abdominis, external oblique are gonna be super, super tight. And that's what is going to bring in, you know, the sway back posture. But then you also see these people with the forward head and this like collapsed chest that tends to happen as well. So they're, the upper abs are just pulling on the sternum, dropping the chest down, caving everything. So when it comes to testing for a sway back posture, it's pretty simple to be honest. Have someone stand from the side, look at them. Do they have a sway back? Yes or no, right? That's simple. Now for testing to see what muscles are involved with this, you'll still wanna utilize a straight leg raise as well as a toe touch. One thing to look for in a toe touch assessment is if they reach down, they tent which tent is just basically they make this shape or it's like a V at their upper back. It's pretty prominent, but what that essentially means is that someone has a lot of abdominal tension and they're pulling themselves down into the position. If someone has that, I'm not putting them on their back in a 90-90. I'm not doing posterior pelvic tilts. They just have abs that are on like crazy. So they're automatically, they're sidelined, rolling activities, alternating. Now, as for a straight leg raise test or a squat or a hip flexion test, those are gonna be tricky measurements with these people. And again, this is something with a trained eye. It took me a while to really be able to, to notice what was going on. But because these people are presenting with the pelvis, you know, they have those deep hip external rotators, they're basically here all the time, which biases external rotation at the femur. Okay, so every time they do a straight leg raise when they're laying on the table, it's gonna look like they potentially have a ton. You know, think of this as like your yogis with a sway back posture. They can whoo, bring that leg all the way up here, you know, knock themselves out with their knee with a straight leg raise. And it's like, wow, okay, is that really accurate? Probably not. They're cheating because of the, the shape of the pelvis. They don't have true straight leg raise. Same thing's gonna go for a hip flexion measurement, okay? They're here, they try to bring that knee up to the chest, they probably can hug it in super easily, and that's just because they're, again, scooping underneath. Their body's trying to right the wrong of an anterior pelvic tilt. So with that being said, I would really stay more toward a toe touch assessment. If you're someone who's flopping over and you have sway back posture and you can palm the floor, again, you're someone that's cheating. 
You know, you have that same posture, just like with the straight leg raise and the hip flexion example, you're all the way out here and that allows for you to just flop over. So testing that with a ball between the knees, feet all the way together, looking for that tenting, things of that nature, or if they're just flopping over, those are all indications that there's something else going on, which is causing that sway back positioning. So hopefully that made sense. If not, you have questions, ask them down below, or again, sign up for that free console. Good indications that you're getting out of that positioning is your toe touch, you don't have as much of a tent, or you're reducing your toe touch and you're not necessarily palming the floor anymore. That means you're bringing your pelvis back to good positioning, you're getting internal rotation of the femurs, all that good stuff. In terms of intervention, so things that are gonna be beneficial are learning how to relax muscle. I've done some posts on YouTube here and even on my Instagram where we talk about rolling, learning how to move without muscle tension, specifically abdominal tension. I'll say right now, if you have sway back posture, or probably any postural deficit, and you're someone who's like always holding a tight core and gripping, you gotta stop that, like yesterday. We can go in on a whole tangent as to why. At least for sway back posture, if you have that upper abs that are grabbing, you gotta stop holding this tight. And I know that's against conventional training advice and physical therapy and all that stuff. Trust me, you gotta let it go. Let it relax, keep your stomach relaxed, even if it pooches out a little bit, trust me. No one cares, wear some looser fitting clothing while you try to fix this stuff. So anyways, back to this. We gotta learn how to move without tension. So I would definitely do some rolling activities, specifically with the lower body. So trying to get you know, one leg over the other, maybe even doing like some upper body rolling, things of that nature. Another, I would say, general principle for sway back posture, trying to alternate. So if you're in the gym and you're working on all this stuff, you definitely want to work on pulling the pelvis back one side at a time. So again, that would look like I need to go this way in that way. So alternate movements, avoid bilateral lifting for now. That's not right forever. It's just right for you right now as you try to fix this stuff. And what that essentially does is that allows for one side of the body to decompress while the other side does compression and it works. Compression is okay. It sounds scary but that just means that that side is working. There's tight muscles when there needs to be tight muscle. You may actually benefit from some prone press ups that can actually stretch the upper abs and allow for that to, you know, stop holding you in this sway back position. Downward dog. I would do that one with a ball between your knees and going back and opening up that posterior hip area. So think every time you do a downward dog and you have something between your knees, that's going to open this up with each and every rep. Hopefully this is making sense. If it's not making sense, leave a comment down below and ask some questions. Or hey, here's a plug. Uh, just jump into one of the free assessments that I offer. We can talk about this and best strategies and we can even work together. Anyways, as for something along the lines of more respiratory mechanics, PRI, those types of interventions, you do not want to put this person in a 90-90 hip lift. That's a big no-no. If you have someone with a sway back, they've already tucked their butt. So you can't put them in a 90-90 where they're tucking their butt all the time, right? It's just not gonna be as effective for that person. From a respiratory mechanics perspective, they need sideline activities. Because what that's gonna do, if we put you on your side, your abs, specifically rectus abdominis, it can't get leverage to pull this pelvis upward or pull your sternum downward and tuck your butt and cave in your chest, right? A sideline activity in which you're laying there and you, maybe you're just like rolling your knee over the roller back and forth. Inhale as you go, exhale as you come back. What that's gonna do is open up one side at a time while the glute and the abs can't get leverage. So it's, again, it's learning how to move without tension. We have to get this tension stuff out of the way, the glutes and the abs out of the way before these other breathing mechanics can really uh, Work as effectively as they can. One thing you can do is more of a hook line with a towel under your low back. If you do that activity, that's basically gonna open up the upper abs and I wouldn't cue a posterior pelvic tilt. Just maybe some hamstring tension would be beneficial, but you don't want that person laying there and like really going after that posterior pelvic tilt because again, they're already there. So that is it guys. If you have any questions, please ask down in the comments, subscribe, like, share this with your friends and I'll see you guys in the next video.